probably within about a week. We did send out yesterday to all the people who had registered as of that point, the PowerPoint, a copy of the PowerPoint. If you registered after yesterday morning, you can email Lori, L-O-R-I dot C dot Watt, W-A-T-T, at state dot O-R dot U-S. Just send her a quick email and let her know you need the PowerPoint if you registered after yesterday morning, and she can send it off to you so you'll have it. Otherwise, we'll post it with the recording on the website probably sometime toward the end of next week. If you're on a group site, would you please text chat us the names of the folks who are there with you so we'll have a record of who's been on the webinar. Um, and then, let's see, we told you that we thought the webinar might go an hour and a half. We think it may only go an hour, but if it does look like it's going to go longer, we'll give you a little quick little break partway through. Uh, we're trying something new today. Mark Acuna is with us. Uh, he'll be the presenter today for the OPI information, but he's up in Warrington. So um, we're trying something different because I'm still down in Salem, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to talk to you about OPI. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark, as Sue Ann said, and I just want to know if everyone can hear me clearly or if there's any echo or problems with the audio. I hope not, but if so, could you let Sue Ann know by just sending a message? But um, I will continue on. This is the first in a series of modules for OPI training that are in development. And we just want to give you an overview of OPI and some of the program basics. And because each AAA has the ability to maybe customize some of the components of the program, such as services and fees, I'll be speaking to those areas only in generalities. The specifics are detailed in your planning service area written plan. So that written plan is important to you and to your local AAA branch. So the things that I'll be presenting are general information about the program and specifics that I think apply to every single AAA involved with OPI. And I want to say from the beginning that I am a part of a AAA here at Northwest Senior and Disability Services. So I'm with you in the same category and um, we'll be looking at this program and hopefully provide this recording so that others who come in later would be able to get some training on OPI if they don't know anything about it. But it's a good refresher for those who do know OPI. So let's get started with some foundational background. First of all, OPI is funded through the Oregon General Fund. So it's Oregon taxpayer dollars that have funded Oregon Project Independence and have been given to us by the Oregon Legislature. The Department of Human Services and Seniors and People with Disabilities are in charge of these OPI funds, and they allocate them to the local area agencies on aging so that we can implement this program all over the state. Now, those agencies are contracted to provide some authorized services to older adults and also with individuals who have physical disabilities that are living within our AAA areas. In a moment, we're going to talk about the qualifications for those individuals that we can serve. But it was the intent of the legislature to really meet the needs of Oregonians and help them have a better quality of life and stay out of institutionalization. So when we look at Oregon Project Independence, we can see that it's a program governed by the Oregon Administrative Rules. And the Oregon Administrative Rules are broken up into several sections. And the Chapter 411, Division 32, are the rules that specifically deal with Oregon Project Independence. So these rules are for all of us and govern 
the Oregon Project Independence all over the state. So we're going to be referring to the Oregon administrative rules as we go through this training this morning. And on many of the slides that I have in this training, you will see the Oregon administrative rules specifically stated. I won't be reading those rule numbers, but you have them in front of you if you've printed out the PowerPoint or you can do that later. Or if you're just viewing this on your computer, it will be on your screen and you'll be able to see the chapter and divisions that we have. So the OARs are the basis for AAA policies and procedures for this program. And the oversight of OPI is provided by the State Unit on Aging. Now, let's go to the basics of Oregon Project Independence and start talking about maybe some of the goals of the OPI program. On the slide that you see right now, we have a couple of the goals of OPI according to the Oregon Administrative Rules. And the first is to promote the quality of life and independent living among older adults and people with disabilities. And the second thing we see there is to provide preventive and long-term care services to eligible individuals to reduce the risk for institutionalization and promote self-determination. So really our goals begin with keeping people as independent as possible. That's what all people would, would want to do. We also want to promote their quality of life through the services that we provide through OPI. And our goal is also to reduce the risk of placement in an institution, and that's specifically in nursing homes. Nursing home costs are very high, and so for a nursing home, it, people might pay upwards of $10,000 a month. That would use up a lot of their personal resources, which would probably disappear quickly. They would be dependent upon the state to help them, and then the cost would be high in an institution to keep serving the, the person. So we want to keep them or reduce the risk of the person going into an institution as much as possible. Other goals for OPI are to provide services to frail and vulnerable adults who are lacking or have limited access to other long-term care services. And we're specifically talking about Medicaid services or perhaps other programs uh, such as the Oregon Health Plan. But by providing services to these vulnerable adults, we are helping them to remain independent and we are promoting their quality of life. We also want to optimize eligible individuals' personal resources and natural support. We're really not going to get into fees and finances in this module, but I want you to know that OPI uh, is on a sliding scale. We try to optimize a person's resources. They really pay in very little for the services that they receive, and we want to make sure that the resources they have are stretched as far as possible, and we also want to look at natural supports that a person has. So if an individual has natural supports that are meeting some needs, we don't want to duplicate those needs, but we want to try to meet needs that are not met or not adequately met. So next we want to go into who is eligible for OPI, and you see the administrative rule number there. Now in order to qualify for authorized services from a AAA service provider, uh, individuals have to meet the criteria that we're going to go over in the next couple of slides, or two or three slides. So first of all, the individual has to be age 60 years or older as a senior. Now, OPI defines a senior a little bit differently than some other programs. Other programs, for example, Medicaid Title 19 have a higher age limit, but for OPI it's age 60 years or older. If a person is under the age of 60, in order for them to be served by Oregon Project Independence, 
they have to be diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease or a related disorder. So in the next couple of slides, what I'd like to do is discuss the Oregon administrative rules that kind of give us a little bit of guidelines concerning Alzheimer's disease and those related disorders. So according to the definition of the Oregon administrative rules, uh, a related disorder means a progressive and degenerative neurological disease that's characterized by dementia. And it includes dementia caused by any one of the following disorders. Now, you see some listed there. And let me just highlight a few. On the bottom of your list on this slide, you'll see diseases like Parkinson's disease, which we're mostly familiar with the physical aspects, but there's also a dementia aspect to Parkinson's, or things like Huntington's disease, which are also very physical, but lead to a progressive degenerative cognitive part of that disease. On the next slide, we have things like MS. And then there's some really uncommon dementias, like Pick's disease or Wilson's disease or some nu supranuclear palsy. Or in general, all other related disorders recognized by the Alzheimer's Association. So really, the Oregon administrative rules have left the door open here to whatever the Alzheimer's Association might discover as being another related disease. So what will really be needed by someone who falls into this category is documentation of their medical condition and really the, di the clear diagnosis, since we're looking at some clear diagnosis in the rules. And we'll want to know that they clearly do qualify as being an Alzheimer's-related disease. There's going to be a little bit more information about this a little bit later in the training. Let's continue on with looking at the qualifications necessary. The person uh, should not be receiving financial assistance or Medicaid. Now, when we're talking about financial assistance, there are a few exceptions. The person can be receiving food stamps. And then there are a couple of programs that assist the person. One of them is the Qualified Medicare Beneficiary. And again, we're dealing here with the Medicare program. And this QMB program pays the Medicare premium and the 20% copay. So they are receiving some financial assistance. The other uh, exception is for the Supplemental Low-Income Medicare Beneficiary Program. That's a, a long one. That is SMB. And that benefit pays the Medicare premium only. So it is OK for a person to be receiving Q food stamps, QMB, or SMB. They will still qualify for OPI. Now, they can't be receiving any other kind of financial assistance, and they cannot be on the Medicaid program or the Oregon Health Plan. So the intent of these rules is to target individuals who are really not receiving medical services through the Oregon Health Plan or receiving long-term care services promoted by Medicaid programs. We really want to target people that don't have those supports, and we want to support them through the OPI program. Another qualification is to meet the requirements of the long-term care priority rules, and that would be the OAR Division 411, I mean OAR Chapter 411, Division 15 rules. Now, for this to be in the OPI rules, it is really telling us that the applicant's OPI eligibility is determined by long-term service rules. Now, specifically, just to make this simple for all of us, 
what this requires is a standardized assessment tool that's going to be Oregon Access using the CAPS tool in order to do an assessment, an OPI assessment, to determine a person's eligibility. There's also the requirement that an assessment be done face-to-face -face in a person's home or care setting. And the determination of the applicant's service priority level. So if you're familiar at all with the Oregon Access CAPS assessment, the end result of that CAPS assessment is an, a service priority level, or we call an SPL level. In the next couple of slides, oh, a, a little bit first, let me give you a note first, a note on Oregon Access CAPS assessment. Uh, when beginning an Oregon Access CAPS assessment, please use only the OPI assessment type for CAPS. It is possible for a person to use a Title 19 type of assessment and then give them OPI benefits, but we don't want to do that. We want to make the type of assessment we're using an OPI type. We have run into some problems in the background mainframe computer system on the state level if we start mixing things up a little. So if we are doing a CAPS assessment on someone, please select the OPI type of assessment, not Title 19. So now let me take you to those SPL levels that I mentioned. So again, just to reiterate, um, OPI rules tell us that we have to follow OARs on assessments and SPL levels. So I'm going to give you a list of OPI levels. They can be found at the OAR that I've listed on the slide. And the SPL levels go from neediest to less needy. So a number one would be the neediest person. And I'm not going to read all of these SPL levels to you. But for example, an SPL3 would require full assistance in mobility or cognition or eating. Now some SPLs have those ORs and some have ANDs. For example, an SPL2 requires full assistance in mobility, eating, and cognition. Now if I go to the next slide and look at some people that are maybe less needy, these are normally the people that we will be looking at for OPI. And so we see that someone who might be an SPL 15 is just someone who requires minimal assistance with mobility. Or an SPL 16, which requires full assistance in bathing or dressing. <laughs> Excuse me. And then there's our threshold SPL 18, because we serve in Oregon Project Independence, SPL 18 or below, and that depends on your area plan, what SPL levels you're taking. But SPL 18 would be independent in the above levels, all the things that are mentioned in other SPLs but requires structured living for supervision for complex medical problems or a complex medication regimen. Okay, so that's our discussion of SPL levels. Your CAPS assessment would determine the SPL, and remember that it is your area plan that determines what SPL levels you are serving in your particular area. Now, an eligibility determination, according to OPI rules, is required before an individual can receive any authorized services from a AAA or a service provider. So we're talking now about eligibility. We've been talking about some of the requirements for eligibility, such as age, CAPS assessment, SPL level. We want to make sure that we have determined that eligibility before giving any services. If there's any documentation required, so for example, if someone is under the age of 60 
and falls into the category of having the Alzheimer's or related disease, we're going to need some required documentation before we can determine the eligibility of that person. And let's look at the next slide. So we have to have documentation that that individual has been diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease or a related disorder. And according to the rules, we can receive that information verbally or in writing from the individual's physician. Now, we're not told that it can come from any other source. We're told that it comes from the physician. So we may need to call a doctor's office or request that the doctor send us written documentation of a person's diagnosis. We want to know the type of related disorder if it is not Alzheimer's disease specifically. And so the physician should specify what the related disorder is. And that information should be re received, reviewed according to the rules that we went over earlier to see if they meet the qualifications of the rule. And then it will be important for you to narrate that information in Oregon Access so we have a permanent record, especially if the information was received verbally then you don't have any paper documentation to file or to put in someone's case file. And in that case, the uh, narration will be very important to substantiating that this person does qualify for Oregon Project Independence because they have Alzheimer's disease or a related disorder. So I, I hope that's clear to us. OK. Mark, yes. Sue Ann, and we have a question, um, another question about eligibility. Um, someone wants to know if we know whether someone receiving a McComas trust payment um, is eligible for OPI. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't know anything about that. That's certainly something we can look into, so Sue Ann and I will make a note of that. And I assume you're asking that question because maybe that is receiving financial assistance. So we're going to see if that particular financial assistance might disqualify them from OPI. And I'm sorry we don't have an answer, but we'll get one. And we thank you for the question. Any other questions, Sue Ann? Not at this time, thanks. OK. So since we were talking about receiving personal information for documentation for a person's eligibility, I did want to just put in here a little bit of information that is in the OPI rules concerning confidentiality. So AAAs are contracted with the state of Oregon to really adhere to the Department of Human Services confidentiality rules for all OPI recipients. So this is just a note to be sure to follow confidentiality policy and to obtain written consent from the recipient or their legal representative if you need information. So for example, in order to get information from a physician, we would probably need written consent in order to receive that information from the physician or to receive medical records. So that, just a note on confidentiality, I'm sure your AAA has some policies also on confidentiality, and it would be good to review those policies. Now, let me talk about, for a moment, who may not be eligible for authorized services. The OPI rules also give us some, a list of individuals that do not qualify for OPI based on the following. First of all, any individual residing in a nursing facility, an assisted living facility, a residential care facility, or an adult foster home setting. So what the rules are really saying there is that in those settings, all of the needs of the individual are being met by those services and by living in those areas or those care settings. And they would 
not be eligible for OPI because we could be duplicating services at that point. But this brings up a situation and an issue, and there's a note here about that that's actually in the rules, and it states specifically, this does not restrict the ability of an eligible individual to move from an institution to their home to receive authorized services when that situation is judged more appropriate. So what we're saying is if someone were, were for example, uh, temporarily in a residential care facility and they wanted to move back home and we wanted to help them out with OPI services, it is possible for that person to apply. It is possible for us to serve them once they move out of the residential care facility and move back into the home. And really, the date of eligibility or when we would begin would be when the person actually moves back into their home and begins receiving services at home. But if a person's going to remain in a facility and receive care, we can't serve them there. So OPI is not compatible with people living in care centers and already receiving services. Okay. Also, any individual residing in a living setting that offers any services authorized under OPI rules, and in a few minutes we're going to talk about those authorized services uh, through OPI. But if someone is living somewhere where they receive some type of services, they may qualify for OPI. But their OPI services are limited to the things that are not already available in their setting. A good example of this would be people who live in retirement housing. Those retirement housing, some of them are high rises, some of them are apartment complexes or duplexes, but they're all senior housing and they might provide very limited services. Some might even provide meals. So let's say they're providing meals in a place where they live and the individual comes on to OPI. We are not going to service them with OPI meals if that's a part of your area plan. That, that's kind of the disclaimer there, I may be talking about a service that is not available in your service area, but I'm just using an example. Uh, so if a meal was provided in their living setting, we would not provide OPI meals for them. So it would be the same with housekeeping. If there is a housekeeper available in a senior apartment complex as part of the rent that they pay there, we would not be providing housekeeping services through OPI. So the intent is to avoid duplication of services and really to avoid replacing services that are already paid for or already provided by other entities. And the savings we get from that allows a greater number of people to be served with OPI funds. Now it's not specifically mentioned in this slide, but we make the same determination with natural supports. If they have natural supports that are providing some services to the individual, and those natural supports intend on continuing them or are able to continue, we don't want to replace the natural supports with paid services. Because the savings that we get allow us to serve more and more people, and we don't want to duplicate services. We want the person's own individuality, their supports to remain strong. It's about self-determination. Let's go on and look briefly at who may apply for OPI. This is a specific rule here that I thought I would throw in. Every once in a while, there's situations like this. All individuals, including those who may have previously terminated from OPI, have the right to apply for OPI authorized services at any time. Now I know probably as workers you've dealt with people who have applied, 
been found not to be eligible and in time apply again. We can't prevent those people from applying and we don't want to prevent them from applying because people's living situation and needs do change over time. They can, they can change overnight. So we don't want to eliminate someone who may actually qualify for the program from applying. So anyone may apply at any time, even if they've had OPI at one point in time and were terminated for one reason or another. And that's part of OPI rule. Okay, so let's talk about the service determination for a moment. OPI rules state that an individual's services are determined after eligibility has been established. So we have a, a process of doing the CAPS assessment, finding the SPL, determining if they fit into the area plan with SPL, and then determining whether the person qualifies. And then we will determine what services the person is to receive. Now, a determination of services and of eligibility should be done at regular intervals, but the OPI rules clearly state that they should be not less than every 12 months. So at least annually, a person on OPI should receive an Oregon Access CAPS assessment. We should find out what their SPL level is and we should determine if they still qualify because of the other qualification factors that OPI requires. Now, Mark, we yeah. have a question. Uh, before you go on, we have a okay. little bit of a clarification question um, having to do with um, if people's natural supports are not always available, um, can they get a specific service from OPI for that time that the natural support isn't able to give that service? The answer is yes. Natural supports are not always comprehensive. Many times they are limited. We don't want to replace what the natural support can do, but if a natural support is unavailable, OPI can step in and help with OPI paid services in order to supplement a person's natural support. That happens all the time. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you. OK. So something else that the Oregon um, OPI rules require is that individuals must receive written notification of their service determination. And because this is official, we want to let people know officially that they've qualified for the program, they can receive services. And this is done using the Form 287L. Now, we are going to be looking at forms at a future time, but I do want to throw this form in there today because we're talking about eligibility. The rule states that the written notices have to include the maximum monthly hours of authorized services for the individual, the hourly and maximum monthly fee if fees are charged to the individual according to your area plan, what the service rate is, and the provider contact information. Written notification of services has to be provided when a person is initially determined to be eligible for OPI. We also have to provide written notification at every annual reassessment, so every year after we do our CAPS and determine whether the person is still eligible, we are going to be providing written notification of that. And when there are changes to the service determination. Sometimes people's needs change drastically mid-year, or there could also be a situation where your area plan changes and you're serving people differently than you did.
people need to receive written notification of any changes in their services or service determination. So here's an example of at least the top portion of the Form 287L, which is the service agreement. And you will be able to find all OPI forms on a form server or your normal way of getting the Department of Human Services forms. And these forms, or this form in particular, for is a mandatory form for notification. And it is the service agreement telling people that they qualify uh, and what the requirements are for them and the fees, if any. So let me just say another note about OPI forms. The rules, the OPI rules state that the collection of required program and fiscal records and data associated with OPI must be on forms and data systems as approved by the department. And you'll see there in fine print the Oregon administrative rules that dictate that. So what that means to us is that we can't come up with our own forms as AAA. We have to use the official forms designated by the Department of Human Services for the OPI program. And that's why we have uh, on track to provide a future training that will really focus on all those mandatory forms and their use. And I think that will be good for all of us to, to review. And as a quality assurance person, I get a lot of questions from our own workers about the forms that are necessary or how to fill them out. So we'll be looking at that very closely, and I think that can be useful to us when we address that as a future time. But that's just a note for us there. So let me give you a brief note also about the OPI fees. According to the OPI rules, a one-time fee is applied to all individuals receiving OPI authorized services who have an adjusted income level at or below the poverty level. And all individuals whose annual gross income exceeds the minimum, and that's stated in the rules, are charged based on the sliding fee schedule as established by the department. And I want to make a note that these OPI fee schedules do change from time to time. A new OPI fee schedule was adopted in October of last year, so you'll be wanting to use the most current OPI fee schedule. You don't want to be caught using an old fee schedule and then being wrong about the fees that you're charging. And again, remember that the area plan also determines what fees apply and what fees are paid or not paid by an individual depending on your area plan. So please look closely at your area plan when it comes to OPI fees. But these guidelines are just general guidelines for OPI. Now, how fees for OPI services are developed, billed, collected, and utilized is contained in that area plan that I was just talking about. And the area plan also contains a policy for addressing non-payment of fees. So the question is, what happens to an OPI individual who does have a fee that they should pay monthly and they're not paying the monthly fee? That's up to your local AAA area plan, which should address non-payment issues. And your area plan may have exceptions that you can make for repayment of those fees or when fees are able to be waived for one reason or another. So please refer to your area plan for questions concerning fees and non-payment of fees. Let me go on to just discuss briefly the grievance process. The Oregon Administrative Rules 
for OPI state that individuals who have services that are denied or disallowed or reduced because of eligibility determination or a service determination are entitled to request a review of the decision through the AAA grievance review procedure set forth in policy. Individuals must continue to receive authorized services until the disposition of the grievance review, and AAAs must provide the applicant with written notification of the grievance review determination decision. So what we're saying is that you should be aware of the grievance policy for your local AAA, and if a person wants to appeal and bring a grievance, we have to continue to serve the individual with the services they were receiving until we come to the end of a grievance process that makes a decision about the person. And that decision that we make in the grievance process should be in writing or written notification to the individual. So please refer to your area plan and the grievance process specific to your branch or your office and area. We're going to next go into the possibilities for OPI services. Now again, I'm going to be reading you a list of authorized services for OPI. That does not mean that your local OPI program offers all of these services. That also is a part of your area plan, which services you can fund and which services you cannot. But I'm just going to give you a general overview of everything that is a possibility under OPI rules. Now, I'm going to look at these in a little more detail, but very quickly, OPI funds can be used for home care, chore services, assistive technology, personal care, adult day services, registered nurse services, and home delivered meals. So let me just take a look at some of these in a little more detail. The OPI rules and the Oregon Administrative Rules do have a section on definitions, and the definitions kind of give us an idea of the scope of what these services are like. For example, home care is defined as assistance with IADLs such as housekeeping, laundry, shopping, transportation, medication management, and meal preparation. So the OARs really help us to define what home care is. Chore services means assistance with, such as heavy housework, yard work, or sidewalk maintenance provided on an intermittent or one-time basis to assure health and safety. So really for this chore service, the Oregon Administrative Rules let us know that this is something that might be intermittent, probably not daily or weekly, or on a one-time basis, and the goal should be to assure health and safety for a chore service. But we will also let, within that definition, we'll let your local area plan define that further as to what chores you provide if any. Let's go on to the next slide. Assistive technology device means any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether acquired commercially, modified, or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of the individual. So that's quite a broad definition for assistive technology devices. And all of us AAAs have been encouraged 
to define what we will do on our local level in the area of assistive technology devices. And that might mean for some area plans that we have narrowed this definition to really only talk about two or three specific types of assistive technology devices. So this is just a general definition of what the possibilities are, but those possibilities are going to have to be defined by the local office and also define whether or not um, your AAA is going to allow for monthly costs for some of these technology devices. So for example, just an example pulled out of the blue would be a lifeline or life alert, some sort of wearable device that a person can use to summon help or assistance. Some of those plans and devices require a monthly maintenance fee. So the AAAs are going to have to decide what technology they're able to support, if any, and it, whether they'll allow monthly costs or not. So that's all up to the local area plan. Let's go next to personal care, which is defined as in-home services provided to maintain, strengthen, or restore an individual's functioning in their own home when an individual is dependent in one or more ADLs. So we're really talking about the ADLs, the activities of daily living when it comes to personal care, or when an individual requires assistance for ADL needs. Assistance is provided either by an in-home care agency or by a home care worker. So the rules specify that personal care is going to be provided by a home care worker or an agency if that's available in your area or a part of your plan. And, and those personal care needs fall under the category of a person's activities of daily living. And that would be anything from mobility to elimination to dressing, hygiene, bathing, all of those things fall into the personal care category of ADL. Let's look at adult day services. That means a community-based group program designed to meet the needs of adults with functional impairments through service plans. These structured, comprehensive, non-residential programs provide health, social, and related support services in a protective setting during a part of a day, but for less than 24 hours a day. Most of us are familiar with adult day services, or at least the definition in our minds. It's not a 24-hour setting. It's for part of a day. They meet a person specific needs for that part of the day, and it helps people who have functional impairment needs. So again, adult day services may or may not be available in your area, or they may or may not be available because of your specific service plan or area plan. Now going on to registered nurse services, this means Services provided by a registered nurse on a short-term or intermittent basis that include or are not limited to interviewing, assessing the ability to perform tasks, preparing a plan that includes treatment needed and monitoring medication, or training and educating providers. <coughs> Excuse me. What we see uh, registered nurse services doing a lot is possibly training home care workers in delegated tasks such as insulin injections or catheter changes or something that needs a medical professional to really provide the training that's needed for the caregiver to do that efficiently and adequately. They're also equipped to do assessments, which would be medical assessments or ADL assessments, to determine what a person's needs would be that an RN could assist with or could monitor. For example, a person who might have 
a, a fragile diabetic that needs a lot of medical monitoring as a supplement to their own doctor visits. So whether or not registered nurse services are available in your area or whether or not they are in the area plan really determines if this is available to the individuals that you serve through OPI. And the same goes for the last one, which is home delivered meals. That means the service that includes the meal provided to eligible individuals in their place of residence. Home delivered meals are prepared and delivered in compliance with state and local laws and meet a minimum of 33 and a third percent of the dietary reference intakes and dietary guidelines. So home delivered meals, of course, are regulated and home delivered meals may or may not be available in your area or through your plan. But it is an option if it is in your plan and it is available in your area. People can receive home delivered meals that are paid for with OPI funds. Mark, I have a couple of questions. All right. Um, one has to do with the chore services and they include yard care, lawn care. But uh -huh. evidently the home care workers are not allowed to do the lawn care or the yard care. So, um, And home care workers, I believe, are who they have to hire for the chore. So do you have any thoughts or comments on that one? Yeah, I think in some areas what has been necessary is that the provider of the lawn care or outdoor chore services has to receive a provider number and there may be a process in order to get that provider number and that allows OPI funds to be used to pay them because they're not going to be paid like home care workers through a voucher system. And so I think those providers have to register with the state in order to get a provider number so that we can pay them. There may okay. be other ways. We'll look into that question a little bit farther, that is a very good question because many home care workers are restricted in what they can and cannot do and most home care workers uh, union agreements uh, dictate that they can't do yard work and some even can't do pet care so they, they won't be doing any outdoor work. So that is a good question to get a little more information on. And then a second question having to do with if somebody uses a walker and they can't stand for more than 15 minutes without assistance, um, uh, let's see, if they use a walker and can't stand for more than 15 minutes, they need assistance or be dependent for mobility for OPI? Yeah, we're really going to cover that in future trainings when we talk about the CAPS assessment itself. And when we talk about the CAPS assessment, we're going to delve into all of the ADLs, including mobility, and look at the rules and tell us who qualifies and who doesn't qualify according to the rules. But for if, in general, if somebody needs hands-on assistance with mobility, whether they use a walker or a wheelchair or any other assisted device, the determining factor is the, is the hands-on assistance. And with that hands-on assistant, um, they, they, they might meet the qualification of the question that's being asked in the CAPS assessment for mobility. So I would refer back to the CAPS assessment question because those questions are very clear to us as to whether a person needs hands-on assistance or not and how often they need it. And then I would also refer you EL rules that talk about uh, the requirements and we can we can post those later so that you know the reference to the ADLs and can look at the rules more carefully yourself and able to determine if a specific situation qualifies or not. So I hope that answers your question, but we'll get you more information that you can look up yourself in the uh, in the rules. 
Thanks. And then one last question goes all the way back to the fee information that you were talking about, how each area plan um, you know, ha has some control over um, fees. And, right. and the question is, um, so does that mean that people can be charged a different sliding fee scale for the same service if they live in different AAA areas? Well, I'm not sure on that. Um, one of the one of the things that I don't have access to at the present moment are the different area plans and those plan specifics on the fees that they charge. But there there is some leeway with the fees and with the services that are provided in the sense that a person, a uh, uh, AAA does not have to provide all the services that we just listed in our PowerPoint. They can select which ones they can afford to and they can also um, adjust fees, but we're going to have to look to other people to give us an answer on that specifically about the fees. Can they change the sliding scale? I will find out from some OPI policy analysts, and we'll try to include that information in an email that we'll send out to all of you, giving you more information on that. I know that you might be curious because you know what is done in your AAA, but you're wondering what happens in other AAAs because of the way that we're phrasing things. So uh, we want to get you some information about that. Thank you. That's it. OK. So we ended with uh, home delivered meals and what OPI funds can be used for. Let me go to the next slide which talks about other authorized services. Now, these other services are authorized on a case-by-case -case basis by the Department of Human Services Director. And it specifically says in rule that services to support community caregivers and strengthen the natural support system of individuals and also evidence-based health promotion services. These services help participants adopt healthy behaviors, improve their health status, and reduce the use of health services. So looking at this particular part of the rule, I would say that local AAAs would be able to appeal to the DHS director if they wanted to use OPI funds in order to somehow strengthen community caregivers or natural supports. And they might have classes, a seminar, something that would help natural supports better care for the people that they're caring for. Or if they had an evidence-based program or health promotion service that could really be provided for the individuals on the OPI program that would help them improve their health status. For example, maybe a class on reducing fall risks or managing diabetes, something like that are all possibilities. But those are services that are authorized only on a case-by-case -case basis by the director. But the rules do let us know that that is in the realm of possibility. OK. So let me look at some other authorized services besides the two that I've just given you that are authorized on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's all options counseling and assisted transportation options that allow individuals to live at home and access the full range of community resources. Now what we're really talking about here are escort services. So we're talking about maybe some kind of transportation option that you have in your community, but we need to pay for an escort to go with the OPI individual in order for them to utilize these transportation options. 
that and the options counseling are other case-by-case -case basis that can be approved by the DHS director as a possibility. Okay, so let's move on and go to service determination. So a service determination is the process of determining the proper authorized services for each eligible individual. And that determination, according to the rules, rests with the AAA. So the AAA determines which authorized services they can offer according to their area plan. And that plan is going to include, among other things, the types and amounts of services to be author, offered, sorry, and the cost of those authorized services. So that's all in the Oregon Administrative Rules. So your area plan determines which services you offer. Some AAAs have limited the list to only two or three of the things that we talked about and they can effectively manage and fund those two or three services and that's the services they provide and perhaps in their plan they have a way of on a case-by-case -case basis providing another authorized service to an individual who might need it. That's all up to the AAA and their area plan. Let's look at uh, just a note that is in the Oregon Administrative Rules about OPI costs. Allowable costs by AAAs are costs associated with the direct provision of services. So what we're saying in this part of the rule is that the Oregon legislature with taxpayer dollars has given OPI funds to the Department of Human Services and trickled down to the AAAs to really meet the needs of people utilizing the authorized services. Now, there can be administrative costs, and those administrative costs can be are allowable costs under the OPI program, but administrative costs cannot exceed 10% of OPI funds. And so this rule is really letting us know that most of the money should be going to direct services to individuals in order to really meet the intent of the Oregon legislature for providing a service like Oregon Project Independence to help needy people. So really with that slide we have concluded our uh, webinar and I'm wondering if there question, might though. be any last questions before we go off the air. But while you're thinking about those questions, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this webinar. We, we do have it recorded, so it's something that others can look at later. Sue Ann, do you have any comments? Mark, I have another question for you. Um, OK. This is from folks wanting to know if future webinars are going to talk about wait lists and the OPI risk tool. Will they be involved in future webinars? Uh, that's something for us to consider. We'll certainly put that on our list of things and we'll, we'll look at them and talk about them uh, to determine if we can put them into some kind of a training. Yeah, and I want to thank you a lot, Mark. We really appreciate the training. We, um, um, I do want to make sure that you guys know we, we did talk a little bit, or Mark did talk a little bit um, about some other trainings. This is the first in a series of at least four that we know for sure, and maybe five sessions on different pieces of OPI. So um, we will be doing a module two about the middle of June, and it will be about the forms and the fees. So we want you guys to watch for that link. Should come out about the first part of June, and it'll be sometime toward the middle of June, and that'll be a webinar. And then in Mid-July and early August, Mark and I will be coming around regionally to different places and doing hands-on uh, regarding the CAPS pieces and the service plan pieces. Um, and so keep an eye out. We're in the process of looking for places and dates on those, and we'll get that information out to you. And then 
after we do those hands-on, we will try to put the information based on your all's feedback and how those classes go into some kind of webinar format with screenshots. Um, and uh, that will, then we'll do that as a refresher sometime in probably September, um, just to make sure that we've got everything covered. So we do have a, a sort of comprehensive plan that we're working on. And as soon as we get it more firmed up, we'll send an email out so that everybody knows what that looks like. Um, so uh, I want to make sure that you guys all remember that we have, um, uh, we will send out an evaluation uh, email with a link to a survey monkey. It's really, really helpful for us. If you guys fill those out, let us know how we did. How is the content? How is the presentation? Um, are you able to use it in your work? Um, you know, how did the technology work for you? Um, just let us know. Those emails come from Lori shortly after the webinars are closed out. Uh, she sends them out to everybody. Again, we will try to get this recording posted on the SUA website with the PowerPoint by the end of next week. Um, and we'll stay on for another couple of minutes. If you have any more questions, I'm not seeing any more, but we really do appreciate your participation. And um, um, there is one more question on here about re natural support. Can an adult daughter that doesn't live with a client be an OPI uh, if they have a provider number? Um, yes. A person with a provider number who's related, except for spouses, that really, that's really a different um, thing altogether according to the rules. It's very strict with spousal pay. But another relative can be paid if they have a provider number. Because they are a close relative like that, they might be considered a natural support, so maybe they would do some things unpaid as a natural support, but they might provide personal care on a paid basis, for example. So it really is about looking carefully at the situation and determining what that natural support is doing unpaid and what we can pay them for and why we are paying them for any services at all. But it is a possibility, yes. Great, thank you. Um, so again, we will keep the webinar open just for a few more minutes, but I think we're pretty much done with the material we hope to cover. So I hope you guys all have a great day, and we thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to um, Another OPI webinar in mid-June, and next week we have a webinar for folks on sodium nutrition diets. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.